Hey, well, good evening and thank you everyone for joining us. This is our first uh, virtual open house this year. Um, that will be targeted towards our fall class start for fall 2018-2019. Tonight we're going to be discussing our graduate program in spatial analysis for public health. Um, presented by uh, our program director, Dr. Frank Carriero, and myself, uh, admissions officer Angelica Santiago. Tonight presenting, you'll be able to see us here. Uh, my name is Angelica Santiago. I'm the admissions officer for the online programs in applied sciences. Uh, I've been working with these programs all three years that it has been running and in higher education for the past five years. Um, Frank, could you please take a moment and introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Welcome, everybody. My name is Frank Corriero, and as Angelica said, I am the Spatial Analysis Program Director for this online program at Hopkins. Um, I've been at Johns Hopkins for about 20 years or so, close to 20 years. Um, my PhD is in statistics, and I focus in an area called spatial statistics. You'll hear a little bit about that field uh, in a couple minutes. Um, but I'm excited to tell you a little bit about our program here and uh, and answer questions we have uh, following our, our webinar. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll be going over our agenda. Um, just to let you know, know a little bit about what you'll be hearing throughout the evening, um, we'll go over spatial analysis and an industry overview, just talking a little bit about why spatial analysis, why these programs were developed, and why the specific focus within public health. Uh, Dr. Carriero will also go through program details. We'll be discussing both our certificate in spatial analysis as well as the full Master of Applied Science degree. And he'll also take you through a little bit on the curriculum and looking through some of the course, discussing some of the course materials. Um, Frank will also give us a chance to learn a little bit more about what online learning is like here at Johns Hopkins University, the rich history Johns Hopkins has through online learning and more into the faculty of who will be leading this program. Um, I'll then go over our admissions requirements and financial aid information, and there will be some time for a, que for a question and answer section at the end. So throughout the, pro throughout the uh, presentation, if you have any questions that come to mind, feel free to just enter them into the chat box, and we'll make sure to answer them towards the end of the presentation. Okay, so let's talk to you a little bit about spatial analysis. And let's start off with what is spatial analysis? Well, it could be a lot of things. Basically, it's the interpretation of geographic information through the use of mapping software and statistical analysis. It builds on the foundations in epidemiology and biostatistics. And like I said earlier, I've been at Hopkins for about 20 years working in this field and really seen the field of spatial analysis evolve over time. You know, in terms of what is spatial analysis, it really can depend on who you ask sometimes and, and what application you're talking about. We've seen it evolve to encompass what we call the spatial science paradigm, which has three primary components. It has a component of spatial data, which speaks to all the availability and accessibility of spatial information that is now out there for us. All these advancing technologies that are able us to collect and harness spatial data. It has a component of geographic information systems, which this is a software, a map making software, but it's a lot more than that. It allows us to integrate these, the spatial information, these spatial databases from multiple sources and link them together so we can make these maps. And then it has this important piece called spatial statistics, which in a sense allows us to go beyond the map. Once you have the map, then you want to interpret the pattern you see and provide some scientific basis for statistical analysis. And, and this is this spatial statistics piece that kind of distinguishes our program from other programs that are out there. So we'll talk about spatial data, geographic information systems, and spatial statistics. And our curriculum follows the spatial science paradigm. Spatial analysis, you know, it, it can arguably said to have started back in the in the mid 1850s with uh, John Snow's famous map and this is the cholera map at the time um cholera was thought to be an airborne disease and um this map is showing um London London England and and people might have heard about the broad street pump um people were getting sick of cholera in in this region and it was clustering 
a lot. And um, John Snow, who was an epidemiologist at the time, decided to map where everybody was living that was getting sick. And he noticed that it was seemed to be clustering around this pump, which is called, which was on Broad Street, and the, the famous um, name for the Broad Street water pump. And uh, he went and removed the handle from that pump, and that cluster of cases disappeared. And uh, and that was probably one of the first more powerful examples of how mapping and spatial analysis um, can really provide information to public health. And that was also the impetus for, for changing cholera from a airborne disease to a waterborne disease, which we all know it is. Well, fast forward uh, uh, quite a bit of time. Um, I want to show you some, some projects that we're currently working on here at, at Johns Hopkins. So this is, um, we have a lot of folks at the school working on in malaria. So what we did was, these are malaria risk maps in Zambia, in, in Southern Africa. And um, this is actually in a province called Enchilenge. And we had collected data on, um, well, groups have been collecting data on who has malaria and who doesn't in this region. And we can use that data along with a lot of other data, um, satellite data, um, data on rivers and, and all these things that are supportive of mosquito habitats. And we build these statistical risk models and we can map the results and we can get what you see here as a map of that Enchilenge province area for the dry season and the rainy season in terms of malaria risk. And what you see just to the right of those maps are what we call prediction uncertainty maps. So not only are we able to produce a spatial prediction of risk, we are actually able to produce a spatial uncertainty in that risk estimate as well. Some other examples of spatial analysis in the general media. Um, flu, everybody's been hearing about the flu. What you see at the top part of the screen here are just the United States flu maps in the first week of November is on the left, in the middle is the first week of December. And then on the right, the map doesn't look that interesting. It, it's the latest week in, in February and, and much everywhere. And the media is using maps now to, to really communicate um, different types of, of public health issues that are going on around the world. I recently saw a map just the other day which mapped uh, Tamil shortages that would be interesting to relate to some of these maps um, in terms of where the flu is and where the shortage of, of some of the medicine. Um, and also with these technologies, now I'm going to talk about down on, on the bottom of the slide here, um, people are being very imaginative in terms of what they can map or different ideas about mapping stuff. This is a map of what has been called um, bio the, our biodiversity footprint. So it's it's the things that people buy and consume can have really consequences for the planet wildlife and both marine and terrestrial. And what they did in this, in this example, they, they collected data on the supply chains of traded commodities in about 187 countries with over 6,000 animals classified as vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. And in terms of the, the harmful effects on, on their habitat, and uh, so again, this is just an example of, of interesting things that are now being mapped. And that was actually published in the New York Times uh, last year. And, you know, there are also a lot of databases out there that are continuing to be developed that are now collecting space information. One is the BRF, BRFSS, which is the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance. So this is a nationwide, a U.S. nationwide database that is continually collected on a bunch of different health outcome indicators with location information. And we're just showing here that location by state, just showing you the trends in U.S. obesity from 2007 to 2013, progressing through 2015. So, so maps are, are out there um, for people that are using and communicating different types of public health issues and concerns. Why spatial analysis? Well, what, what you don't see on the slide here, and this is what I talk about in class a lot, is that geography may be a source of variation worth considering. And if you think about that for a minute, 
what that is saying is that you know once you have location information and you're able to put that dot on the map you can start asking a lot of other questions about well what else is going on at that location what's the environment like what's the social demographic environment like what's the water like the air environment the school environment all these different kind of indicators and you can group all that data together and then you can really start answering that question about well how does geography affect what I'm looking at, whatever, whatever outcome you're looking at? Um, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, the uses of geospatial technology are so widespread and diverse that they're claiming the market is growing at an annual rate of almost 35%. And just as important to that, there is an increasing demand for this type of spatial information that can be readily available, accurate, complete, current, and once you have that information, then you need the people that know how to work with that kind of information. You need the people that need to know how to, one, collect, obtain, and create that type of spatial data, how to get that spatial data into a system like a GIS and map it and integrate it and put it all together. And then you need people with the skills that can take that next step beyond the map and actually analyze that type of spatial data. So this was an interesting article that, um, that we saw, and it has a really catchy title. It says up there, what gets measured gets done. And if you think about that, that's a pretty powerful statement and a pretty true statement, okay, that we are always looking for things to work on. And, and what we see, what, what is done in terms of what gets measured is usually what, what gets worked on. And a lot of the public health leading agencies, CDC, EPA, city and state health departments, they recognize that there is this urgent need for more timely and more geographic specific data at small scale areas like neighborhoods or census tracts to efficiently and effectively address some of the most pressing problems in public health. So in terms of the need for not just spatial data, but the, the expertise to work with that spatial data, it, it is definitely out there for sure. So when you think about careers in, in spatial analysis, there, there could be a number of different careers, that some more narrowly focused than others. Um, spatial analysis public health can be used among a lot of traditional public health careers that are already out there. So it's almost like an added benefit to what you are already are currently trained in doing and are doing, and now you add this expertise of spatial analysis to that. It, it's definitely a, uh, a benefit-adding component. Um, some possible jobs, environmental health officer, GIS software developer, a geographic information scientist, a spatial statistician. Um, these are just examples of different types of jobs that are out there. But probably, you know, the, the most important point to make here is it's that added benefit to what you're already doing is now you can add space analysis to, um, to your niche of, of expertise. In terms of some of the details of our program, so we offer two programs here in, in spatial analysis at Johns Hopkins. We offer a Master's of Applied Science in Spatial Analysis for Public Health. This is a 50-term credit program. It, it goes over two academic years. It has courses, professional development courses, and has its rate of activity, which I'll talk about in a little bit. That's like a capstone type project. We also have a graduate certificate in spatial analysis for public health, which is a one-year, 18-term credit program. And I'll bring up the curriculum for both the master's and the certificate and talk a little bit about them in the coming slides. Uh, thing is skill-based orientation for working professionals. It's part-time, 100% online. It's logically contemporary, group learning, peer assessment. We have skills-oriented. So you have projects, examples, things on learning, and the focus is on local and global issues. So the goal is to prepare students to address public health problems through multidisciplinary approaches that apply the latest scientific knowledge in spatial analysis. So here's a specific curriculum for the Masters of Applied Science in Spatial Analysis for Public. It's a two-year program, and I'm not gonna list or go through each one of these courses. On our website, we have 
the courses listed, um, the description of the courses, as well as the course learning objectives. So I, I encourage everyone to go there and look for more details. But we have, we have core spatial classes, okay? Spatial analysis and um, one, two, three, and four. And you can see in this first year, so Hopkins is each year is split up into quarters instead of semesters. So you can think about two quarters per, per semester. Um, in the first quarter of the first year, you're taking spatial analysis for public health. That's a core class which kind of introduces the topic of spatial analysis for public health, but it focuses on learning the ArcGIS software. In term two, we have spatial data technologies for mapping. So this starts to speak to the spatial data component of that spatial science paradigm, where it's all about the availability and accessibility to spatial data and the advancing technologies that are out there, whether it's using smartphones, drones, satellite information, this kind of stuff to collect and harness spatial information. The first year also has epidemiology, epidemiology biostatistics courses. So the MAS program has two courses in epidemiology and two courses in biostatistics and rest are filled with spatial courses. So then in the second year, you will, you'll see in the second year, you have your second statistics course and your second epidemiology course, but then you have an applied spatial statistics course. So this is, speaks to the spatial statistics part of that paradigm. We have a spatial statistics journal club follows along with that applied spatial statistics course where we're reading articles that have been published and interpreting them. And, and, and you can see in some of the tools that we learn in one course and we're reading about them in papers in another course. We have this spatial applications course in the last term of the second year. Um, this is following through various spatial applications sort of on your own. Things that we package up for you that have you work on so you can apply all the tools that you've learned in the previous spatial epidemiology and biostatistics courses. Then there's this integrative activity course. We actually have a course designed for students to work on and complete a sort of independent spatial analysis project on their own using everything they've learned in the course. And, and the final product of that course is this written report and analysis of some spatial analysis project that either you propose or we propose for you. And now let's talk about the graduate certificate. Okay, so the graduate certificate is just one year. It has the same core courses in spatial analysis. This certificate program is designed for students with a prerequisite background in biostatistics and epidemiology, epidemiology already. So if you have that background, if you have a master's of, of public health, or you have, you've had enough epi and biostatistics in your undergrad or other career courses, then you, you can take the certificate. So the certificate has spatial analysis for public health, spatial data technologies for mapping, applied spatial statistics, spatial st statistics journal club, and this course on spatial applications. There is no integrative activity or capstone project for the, um, for the certificate. And so not only does the certificate have the same core spatial classes as the master's program, but the students are taking these classes together. So the certificate students are in the same core spatial classes as the two-year math students. So that it's not any different classes that, that had one program has over the other in terms of the, space, the core spatial classes. So let's talk a little about the online learning at the School of Public Health. This is Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. You know, um, over 20 years ago, the school got into online learning and um, we had an online learning department that is probably one of the top in the world. Uh, the courses are developed with high production value. Um, I, I'm down in the studio, this, this soundproof studio down in the basement of the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And, and the technology down there is amazing in terms of, of how we produce these things. Um, our course activities, so uh, the online course activities are designed to keep students engaged throughout the program. As faculty, we record our lectures, which provides 
increased flexibility to the students. So you can watch this at any time of the day or week that you prefer. And then for each course, we have what's called live talk. So this is where we come on, like I'm on now, and the students can listen and we have a discussion and they can ask questions very similar to the, um, to the open house experience that, that you're having right now. Um, we also have a 24-7 help desk too, which is extremely valuable. Here's our esteemed faculty that teach in the space program, both in the certificate program and the, the master's program. I'm not going to go through all their names. Uh, I know a lot of these colleagues for a very long time. I've worked with them on projects within the school. We developed this spatial analysis program for public health online together. Uh, you're welcome to go on the website and um, these faculty are listed there and they have short bios too that you could uh, that you can read and link to their Hopkins webpage and find a lot more about them. But um, all of them are great and all are great teachers as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Carrero, for kind of walking us through the details of the program, the curriculum, the courses, and what the online experience um, will be like. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go through admissions requirements. Um, both, of, both of these applications go through um, SOFIS, which is an online application portal for public health schools that John Hopkins participates through. Um, there is two different SOFIS accounts where the master's degree does, it does get processed through SOFIS and the certificate is processed through SOFIS Express. Um, so a couple of basic differences that we could share more details on, but essentially to apply to either program, Students do have to uh, show completion of a bachelor's degree from an accredited college or university. They should also be able to demonstrate or provide back sufficient prior um, quantitative coursework in their background or other alternative evidence of quantitative ability, um, whether that be through um, coursework or professional experience. Um, three letters of recommendation is what's needed for the full master's degree where one letter of recommendation is required for the certificate. In each application process, students will be required to complete a statement of purpose, really being able to demonstrate uh, the, compat the compatibility of their personal career goals or interests with the ed educational objectives and the competencies of each individual program. Um, for our students who are viewing right now, who are international, um, the English um, examination through TOEFL or ILETS is required, as well as an evaluation, a course-by-course -course evaluation of any education that has been received outside of the U.S., uh, which is done via the World Education Services. And if more details on that are needed, we're happy to share that with everybody on a on a case-by-case, one-on-one basis through conversation and through email. Um, for our students, information that they should know through the application process is that our applicants are reviewed monthly. So as you are working through and completing your applications, you're able to hear back on your decision and plan properly for what the rest of the year is going to look like for you and be able to really get ready for the um, education that you'd be receiving in the fall. So we do encourage students to apply as soon as possible. The application deadline for this program is going to be on Sunday, July 1st. Um, students are enrolled one time per year, so as you're working through applications or as you're working through your decisions on, on applying and moving forward, keep in mind that our students who are not able to start with us now on September 4th of this year would be waiting until the following fall. Um, so our program will start this year on September 4th, 2018. Um, so definitely encourage students to apply and start working on applications as soon as possible. The per credit tuition for this program is 1,091 per credit. We do have a scholarship that is specific to our online applied science degrees, which will cover about $419 on each credit leaving students responsible for $672 per credit. This is based on the 2017-2018 tuition rates. 
So keep in mind, each, each late spring, we do review tuition rates and scholarships and each are reassessed. And the information is posted pretty promptly on our site as, it, as that is done. Um, but there is no additional application for the scholarship itself, no additional forms um, to complete. The scholarship is specific to the program and merit base. Um, beyond scholarships, if you need more details regarding financial aid, um, the information is listed here for our financial aid services, their phone number as well as their email address to be, so you can consider any federal or private loans that you may need to consider with looking at the different programs. At this time, I'd like to open up to just a, a brief Q&A session. Um, Dr. Carrillo and myself are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, we'll start off with, I think we received a couple during the presentation. Um, Dr. Carrillo, I think this would be great for you to start off and answer. Um, this individual would like to know if they need a public health um, undergraduate degree for this program. Well, for the, the certificate, you should have some epidemiology and biostatistics background, um, which which means you had some type of a public health background. It doesn't have to be like a identified public health degree. For the master's program, in in, in for the two-year master's program, we basically provide you a a public health background. So you have the the two epi classes, and if you looked at that curriculum, there is more seminars in public health and so forth. So for those interested in, in the two-year master's program, we look for, for people who are interested in public health more so than those that have a public health background. A lot of our applicants do come from some type of public health background, but it's not necessary as long as you have the interest at that point for the two-year degree, because we provide you the necessary background in public health. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think I'll be able to cover this next one. There was just a quick question um, whether the scholarship is in fact automatically awarded in merit-based. Um, when I referenced merit-based is that if you are qualified and admitted to the program itself, the scholarship is then automatically awarded. So yes, the students going in um, based on the 2017-2018 tuition rates could plan for the $672 per credit if they are admitted into the program. Um, so the scholarship will be automatically awarded to those who are admitted. Um, Dr. Carreiro, I think this will probably be a great one for you to share. Um, they have some questions about our current cohort and a few examples of students, uh, job titles who are currently in our program. So any details you can provide about our current cohort and maybe the demographics of, of those students. Yeah, I wish I could remember the how many are um, local to the U.S. and how many are international. I think we had about, oh, um, I would say about a quarter, a little less than a quarter of that were international. Um, in terms of where they're coming from, um, let's see, we have, um, we have several nurses in the program. We have several that are... Um, I think we have one or two MDs. We have, um, we actually have a fireman and a sheriff. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think. It's a really good question. Um, I'm trying to go back and look. We have others with public health background, more so based on their job, whether they're working for a, a health insurance company or um, doing some analysis on hospital databases and so forth. But you see, no one's coming into the two-year program with, let's say, a master's of public health because the they would have had all the biostatistics and epidemiology already. We've we've had a couple people actually did apply that had masters in public health. They looked at our two-year program and say, you know, half of that is what I've had already. You know, and they just want the spatial stuff, and that's kind of motivated us to um, to do the certificate. So now those people are going to re-enter the program just doing the one-year certificate, which just provides the, the uh, spatial content. Right, Sorry. and I think I can, no, I think that's great. I think I can add to that with some of the current um, applicants towards the program that we've been speaking to. Um, academic backgrounds will vary. 
Um, like you mentioned, we do have those who have clinical backgrounds and some doctors, some nurses. So there is students who do have master's degrees, bachelor's degrees. Um, so there is a, it seems to be a very big variety of students that are looking for these skill sets. Um, so there is not one type of candidate that fits within this program. There's a lot of different backgrounds that are looking into this type of coursework. Um, I think another great question came in regarding the softwares that are used throughout our program, um, with which, statistic, which statistical software and which mapping software are primarily used. Could you give us some details on that, Dr. Carriero? Yeah, sure. That, that, that's a great question. So the mapping software is taught in the ArcGIS software, which is an free product, ESRI, the name of the company. This is probably the most popular mapping GIS softwares that are out there. In terms of the statistical analysis, we use the program R. Um, these are used in the biostatistics classes, and then they are also used in the spatial statistics and spatial applications class uh, to program everything in R. We, we've gone back and forth in terms of you know, what software we should use and so forth, and there's not one software out there that can do all the things we want to do and, and teach in terms of spatial statistical analysis other than R. So, um, so it's ArcGIS and R are the two primary softwares out there that do the spatial analysis. Thank you. Um, I, we did have a question come in regarding online learning um, that I'm happy to answer. And Dr. Carrero, after I answer this, if you feel like there is more details you can provide. Um, a student's asking if, what, what experience do you need in online learning, if you need prior experience in online learning to be successful in this program? Uh, as we mentioned earlier, there are students with a variety of backgrounds. Some of our students have been out of school for quite some time. Some have had no experience with online learning previously. Uh, what's great about our online platform is that it is specifically designed um, by Johns Hopkins, and there's also an introduction to online learning that is offered beforehand. It's a free course that is offered monthly, so if you have any questions or any concerns with being involved in online learning, what the platform looks like, it's a free course that is invite, everyone's invited to attend if they are considering our online program. Um, so I'm happy to talk about if there's more like time concerns. I would say that on an average, our students should should be able to plan on average for maybe about 18 to 20 hours a week if they are taking the program, the full master's degree within a two-year schedule. Um, that does vary a little bit with because there are less classes in the certificate. Um, but we're always happy to discuss more sort of one-on-one -on -one if you have specific questions about your schedule and what that looks like. But essentially, you do not need prior experience in online learning to be successful in our programs. It's a very friend, um, user-friendly platform. Yes, I, I, I would definitely agree, um, Angelica. You know, when I was in school, there was nothing close to online learning and, and so forth. And um, the age makeup of the students in the cohorts that we have going on now are quite varied. So there are um, younger students in there that have had online classes or experienced online learning throughout their undergraduate. And there are some in there that um, weren't around when when uh, this stuff was, was being developed. They weren't in class at that point. They were already out in the workforce. So um, I, and like Angelica said, I think I think we definitely have a user-friendly setup and something that you pick up right away in terms of the online learning. Great. Um, Dr. Curio, I think there was an additional question um, as far as your opinion on a program like this and students that are interested in um, transitioning later on to either PhDs or um, CRPHs, if this would be a suitable program, in your opinion, to go with that as the next step in their academic um, goals? Um, yeah, it definitely, it definitely matters on where you're coming from first into this program. Um, if you already have, let's say, a master's degree in, um, in public health, but you want the, the spatial experience, and um, you know, so maybe you would take our certificate and then maybe jump into a PhD or DRPH in, uh, in public health, 
Um, that that's certainly fine. Um, so if you wind up in a place that doesn't have the spatial classes, and and I can't think of a lot of universities out there that have a full suite of courses. Um, the courses that that we teach here on site, uh, excuse me, online in in either the certificate or the master's program, we have a um, similar sequence of courses on site. And I don't think there are a lot of other schools and universities out there that have this many classes in, in spatial analysis. Again, speaking to that whole spatial science paradigm of spatial data, GIS, and spatial statistics. You have a course here and there embedded in geography or environmental planning or, or environmental engineering that, that speaks to some of these things, but not not a sequence of course that all connected like like we have at Hopkins. Um, but to get back to your question, um, yes, it could definitely be a stepping stone into a DRPA or a PhD program. And actually, you know, it'll give you good insight into is this something you want to continue to pursue? A lot of us that have gone on to do doctoral degrees, whether PhD or DRPH, you know, there was a master's in between there that we could have stopped at or motivated to go on further. So um, it, it's definitely a stepping stone for sure. Wonderful. And it sounds like it would be a great stepping stone to help with their skills as, as far as research is concerned as well, depending on yeah. what direction they go in. Definitely. Good point. Wonderful. Um, just for any students who are interested, um, we had a couple of questions come through that if you um, have any on-ground components to this program, it is a fully online program, so there, there is no on-ground campus commitments or residency or anything required. Um, there's also not an opportunity to transition to this on-ground as this program is delivered specifically fully online. But I will um, add to I'm that sorry. that we have gotten several requests for students that are in the Baltimore area where Johns Hopkins is, if they can come by and visit and meet myself and some of the other professors and teach that they hear us all the time. And the answer to that is a resounding yes. We would always love to meet students in person, face to face. So if you're ever in the area and you're in the program, please let us know. We'd be happy to make accommodation so we can so we can meet. Wonderful. I think the last question we'll go over um, is just a question, just understanding if there is not, if someone completes the certificate program but feels they would like to then work towards the full master's degree, is that a, is that an opportunity that they can do um, to go back and then complete the full master's degree? Okay. I guess you're gonna let me answer because I actually yeah, don't I know the answer. That one. Um, that's oh well, I can go over. I can go over that process. Um, in admissions, they do have a little bit of background um, with students working towards. Um, if they have completed the certificate, you can, in fact, go back and then do the application for the full master's degree. Um, and once you're admitted to the full master's degree, the programs that the, the courses that you took through the certificate would then apply to your master's degree. So you would basically be completing the classes um, and not wasting any time or any effort um, with what you have already completed through the certificate. Um, Dr. Currier, I think a great question for you to take over would be students trying to understand as far as statistical techniques they learn and a little bit about how they apply specific to GIS mapping and maybe what kind of background you're looking for as far as quantitative background. So if you come into the master's program, you know, you're going to be taking two biostatistics courses before you take the applied spatial statistics course. Um, if you come into the certificate program, we assume you have that biostatistics background. And by that background that we want you to have or that you will get in the two courses in the master's program, is familiarity with regression analysis. So you got, you got the usual probability statistics and exploratory statistics and, and that kind of stuff, but um, to, to get into spatial statistics, we need expertise in linear regression, Poisson regression, and logistic regression. And you'll get that in the biostatistics courses in the two-year master's program, 
And that's the quick answer to the type of background, quantitative background that we want you to have coming into the certificate program. Perfect. And as far as anyone that is curious with what um, Dr. Carriero mentioned, just to add to that, you do not have to have prior experience in using R. So using the statistical software R, you do not have to have prior experience um, in that specific software to apply to the program or be admitted. That's correct. Um, I, I think that is all the time we have for questions this evening. I do know that there are a few additional questions out there. Um, just so that you can see right here on the screen is the details for my email as well as my phone number. Um, so if you take down the information for my email, send me a direct email this evening or anytime this week. I will reconnect with you personally um, to kind of go over specific um, questions um, that are connected to your background and that might be easier to answer on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, we can also schedule some time to speak one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so please feel free to take a moment to take down um, my office phone number as well as email address. Um, I thank you, Dr. Carrero, for taking some time to talk with us this evening about the program and share more insight. Um, and I appreciate everyone for taking some time to hear about information for the program this evening. Thank you for being with us. And we'll look forward to the start of a, many applications and uh, the start of our fall 2018-2019 cohort. Great, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.